Rose B. Simpson. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo. I'm an artist, a sculptor, performer. I try not to uh, racially designate myself without completely negating my cultural background or, or my context. I come from a big family of artists. My mother and father are both artists. Um, my mother is from Santa Clara Pueblo in northern New Mexico and my father is non-Indian. So many processes in my life are about sort of deconstructing what we've been given and the ideas and the theories and the, you know, I'd say judgments that we carry around all the things that we you know, engage in in our lives. And then because I needed to talk deeply about what indigenous aesthetics was and where I came from and how that influenced my artistic processes, I decided to go back to school and get my second master's in creative nonfiction in order to write a scholarly text on indigenous aesthetics that can be used for educational purposes. And I did go back to school and back to school because I wanted so deeply to understand that dichotomy and to understand that division and how to, in our post-colonial context, engage both sides of that and try and understand how the creative process and how the creative process in itself is a healing and spiritual endeavor. You know, the things that we navigate in our world today are violence against our environment and our resources that are not relationship but objectified. And so I think um, some of the deepest things that I found is that when we objectify something, then we use it. And, and being of a cultural background that is deeply objectified and stereotyped, that I understand very strongly how dangerous that is to objectify something. How do you prove that you're worthy in a community that has uh, abused, integrated you, and were at the, the hands of genocide of your people? I think there's two different artistic avenues that indigenous people have. And one of those is to focus very deeply on empowering and strengthening the foundation of our cultural background, right? And that which has been stolen from us. And the other is to do the work to build conversation with the oppressor and enter into those spaces and deconstruct the very things that have oppressed us. This one is called Introspect and it's about the relationship to all the different parts of ourselves and how we can really access those and be conscious of them. The pieces I'm making for the show are actually really spiritual and I, and I know that's uh, sort of taboo in a lot of ways, but I care less. <laughs> if I allowed myself, oh, this makes me want to cry, so that means it's real. If I allowed myself to say what I wanted to say the way I wanted to say it, it wouldn't look like what I'm doing because I don't feel safe. I've, I've been uh, physically hurt um, by speaking my truth. And so often we learn how to communicate with immense tact in order to uh, survive and still try and make change so the next generations will, you know, have a different world that may not be as violent, be as uh, destructive to their heart's desires. My name is Rob Rael. I'm a local artist here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I swore I would never be an artist. Uh, my mom struggled raising three boys by herself. And of course, I chose to be a rock star, which is the other starving artist. I think my work is actually very musical, if you really look at it. You know, the color, the movement. There's a lot of music in it. I wasn't expecting to sell anything. That very first show, I sold 10 paintings. And to me, I was like, and I was accepted. I was so proud of my show, what I had to display. I had 25 paintings I had done within a year, and I was proud of every single one, because the style just, it was me. 
and I didn't care what was going to happen that weekend. I just, I was having a great time just showing it. So I think the public just pushed me, said, okay, no, you need to do this. <laughs> On the surface, definitely, it's, it's very comic-like. Um, I grew up with comic books, you know, I love Star Wars and uh, toys, things like that. So, it, and I'm very playful, I'm very childish. I've always have been since I was young, you know, even more so. But underneath, I have some very dark theme paintings I've done. And they're more personal, but they come off very light and because of the way I execute them. They don't come off so dark and heavy where people can accept it. I've been painting skateboards since probably I was a teenager when I rode them. And, but one thing I started to do was put a snowboard as the vertical piece and the skateboard as the horizontal to make a cross. It's a dragon. And then there's a writing in here. In the beginning, that's what you're doing. You're creating things that come from you, from your feelings, from your experiences. And if they strike a chord with someone, that is powerful. And that really is a, is a motivational factor for continuing. My name is uh, Connie Sosi Gasson. This is my business name. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. My mother is from Picaris Pueblo, and my father, my late father, is from the Navajo Reservation. All of them used to watch me work at soldering at my jewelry bench, and they would go away, especially David would say, I want to play too. You know, so <laughs> that's how it kind of like just, you know, got into their hearts and they wanted to do that. So they all are artists. She taught us doing very traditional style Southwest Native American jewelry, but then she also encouraged and pushed us to just do our own thing. And finally, at one point in my career, I had to just decide the person who I am as a person does not have to be the person I am as an artist. I can still be a traditional Native American person in my personal life, but that doesn't necessarily have to carry through my art. And there may be aspects of my traditional design in my jewelry and the materials I use and the techniques I use, but it doesn't have to define the design of it. And once I kind of freed myself from those shackles, and, and I just decided, this is what I want to do. What's considered traditional today was not always traditional. You know, that's just human evolution. The coin term traditional is just a kind of reflection back on that period of work. And what they were doing was really nothing traditional. It was completely all new. It was completely brown breaking in terms of their s styles and um, developing their techniques you know, that are still used today. And I think maybe because it was so beautiful that it still carries that presence, you know, through the imagery of what Native American jewelry looks like. It's like museums came in and decided that time period is now frozen in time and it's traditional, where it wasn't always that way. Thousands of years from now, they may look at us now and say, wow, that was traditional. Now you're doing, you know, it's just whoever says it. And so to me, it's funny. <laughs> we need to really respect our ancestors, their type of work that they used to do. We come from a long line of artists and uh, a lot of them have gone to the better world, I call it. They left us with all this beauty and we have to respect the earth. Our family also, like everybody, comes from a long line of ancestors. And our ancestors fought really hard for us three people to be here today. Like our Pueblo of Picaris has a very hard history and I encourage everyone to research it. 
But what our ancestors and even our Navajo ancestors, what they did for us to be here today always boggles my mind. And so to me, I think it's just having respect, like my mom was saying, for those early ancestors and to just keep pushing yourself to do better. My name's Ricardo Cate. I'm from Santo Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico. I draw a cartoon called Without Reservations that appears in the Santa Fe New Mexican. It's the only native cartoon in the United States that appears in a mainstream newspaper as a daily. Cartoon is very therapeutic for me and uh, uh, I found out later that it was therapeutic for other people because uh, when my dad was in the hospital for a year, I was about 13 when uh, he had broken his back in three places so he had to be in the hospital and so my mom would cry and then one day I just got this idea hey I'm gonna show her one of these cartoons that I drew so I came and you know showed it to her and she started laughing and so I had enough that I was able to show her a cartoon every night for for a whole year and it made her feel better it made her laugh and uh, it made me feel better I feel very uh, privileged that you know, to, to give a voice to uh, the Native community, especially my community, because we have a lot to say. And Natives generally have a sense of humor, and a lot of old movies don't depict that. They pick, uh, they pick us as uh, very stoic and, you know, very serious and, mm, uh, you know, that voice. But we're not like that at all. We're actually very, very funny. Their, uh, humor plays a large role in, in our culture. And uh, uh, my Pueblo people alone, we've been through a lot of things since the Spanish came in in 1540 to New Mexico, and then um, other natives, probably uh, other tribes, experienced the Europeans coming out here, and you know, there's there's all these stories. And but I think for the most part, a lot of natives' humor really, uh, like I said, played a large role in in, uh, in the way we deal with. Uh, the situations that we're in. People who are watching me, like they'll they'll see the picture and painting, you know, it's just a guy chasing a rabbit, but then but I just put one word on it and it becomes a cartoon and so I'm gonna put that here. Fast food. This cartoon has given me that voice. Um, I don't speak for all, na all natives. I don't speak for Native American people. It's just that I draw this cartoon and my characters just happen to be native and I really have something to say. I address the issue, but uh, from a humorous point, and a lot of people can't figure out if I'm for or against, which is great for me, but what is more important is that I draw about that topic and it gets people to start discussing and uh, the communication starts. It opens a, a lot more doors than people shouting at each other. And people need to, to hear our voice because I grew up reading history, American history, which is his story. And there's maybe a thick book like that, maybe two pages of Native Americans. And so we haven't really been heard. But then when we do speak up, uh, uh, People, uh, people don't know uh, how to react because we, you know, we have something to say. The fact that uh, our voices have been muffled or, or just completely taken out—that's all I want—is uh, to let people know that uh, we've been through a lot, but we're still here. My name's Bruce Hamilton. I'm Susanna Carlisle. We started to make sculptures. And from sculptures, she got into video. From that, we moved into what we're doing now, which is video sculpture. 
video in the past has been very much a moving painting. And since we are so interested in three-dimensional space and movement through three-dimensional space, and when you video, you are in three-dimensional space and you're documenting something that is three-dimensional. Part of the reason we do the, the sculpture, sculptural aspect as opposed to just the plain video, is that you have an object that exists when there's nothing on it. In other words, you can have an object a piece that doesn't need to have video on it, though when the video goes on, it adds another dimension to it. We create um, a place for contemplation, almost a sanctuary for people to just be mesmerized not only by the video, but also by how it moves on the object. And it just gives them in this moment in time where everything is so busy and rushed. I think as artists, you try, you convey something from your, your feelings, your meaning outwards, and hopefully it, it penetrates, little ripples go out and they, they go to someone else. They, someone looks at them and says, oh, I hadn't thought about that before, or... Maybe they have a whole different idea that you didn't even think about when you were doing it, which is yeah. even more wonderful. We do try and address the environmental issues that, that we're facing. If, if all of Greenland melts, we'll have seven meters of sea rise. I mean, that's just, that's not the world we know now. Seven meters is, what, 22, 23 feet, whatever. I mean, it's, it's an enormous change. And we're just we're not really changing we're just nope. plowing ahead so yeah. we're trying we're trying to address this just in our little tiny way to see if people can say oh well maybe i don't maybe i can walk to the grocery store instead of drive Meryl E. Carver. I'm an activist, a poet, and an artist. I'm 18 years old. I think at a very early age, my first coping device was art. My first way of being articulate in my emotions, my first way of communicating. When I was young, I spent a lot of time in and out of the family court system, trying to gain legal freedom from my mother, who was abusive. And because of that, I ended up articulating at a young age my beliefs and my emotions and my trauma to lawyers and judges. I've never been afraid that I'm not going to be heard because I've already lived that fear, I think, as much as I can in this life. As an artist, it's my belief that if you want to attack an idea, you have to start with art. I can't draw a fine line between the work that I do as an activist and the work that I do as an artist. The work that I do as an activist is increasingly creative and abstract and performance-based. Uh, protest, in many ways, is a piece of public performance art. It's a piece of social practice. It's just a community-engaged version of what happens sometimes in galleries. At the same time, my visual art um, and my poetry, which I just consider like a verbal art, is all in a similar genre, exists often for political purposes or is useful as a political tool. The seal for the state of New Mexico was cut out of a business card I got during my first closed door meeting with a politician. Throughout her body, uh, I used these pieces of a poem that I wrote. I tore it up, I tore it to pieces, and it was a poem about the process generational trauma and tokenization. Even creating a piece of art that is emotionally authentic is an act of political resistance because it is an act of emotional authenticity in a society that is deeply failing to do that in its cultural creations. But affecting the way that we live and creating the ideas that give meaning to the way that we live should never be a niche, should never be something for a few people to do. We know so much about politics and we know so much about art. 
you don't need specific training to have the right to create and the right to be heard. When it comes to politics, the people who will tell me that they don't know enough, if you believe in the existence of systemic racism, if you believe in the danger of climate change, if you believe that trans people are human beings who deserve full human rights, you're doing well. You're doing, you know more than a decent third or half of the American political system. 